How do you address the question of archival ethics? Is there a friction between the original filmmaker's intent and yours? So I think in working with archival material, I do always try to think about a kind of ethics of the archive in, in the sense of, for example, Padma's 10 theses on the archive, uh, thinking about intellectual propriety as opposed to intellectual property. Uh, and it was important to me before I started making this film. So before I started working with this material with the intent of making a feature film, I did ask all of the directors who are still alive whether they wanted to finish their films. Uh, and the only one who did was Latif Ahmadi, and he was already working on finishing his film. So what we were able to do there was to actually use uh, the licensing fee for his footage because he's the only one who Gomashta was actually independently produced, so we were able to pay the licensing fee directly to him. Um, we were able to use that licensing fee to help him finish his film. That helps as a kind of archival ethics there to, mm -hmm. to help him realize what he wanted to do with the footage. Um, and also to kind of make these larger festivals aware of the existence of his film. Some of the places where we played, you know, then became aware of this fact that he was finishing this film and, you know, would be became interested in, in showing it. None of the other directors were interested in finishing their films and they were like, you know, Bismillah, go, go ahead, <laughs> just do, do whatever you want with it. Um, and so I felt like we, we kind of had their blessing to, to go ahead and make something new with it. Um, and with Latif's footage, we actually did use scenes that he had already cut. So we didn't necessarily, you know, change them. We, we recut a tiny bit, but we basically used them as he had cut them. So we, we worked with it within his intentions. Um, and with the other stuff, we, we did cut it how, you know, we thought we, it should be cut basically based on how it had been shot. Now, where that gets a little bit tricky in terms of this question of intention is where the, the image sound relationships come into it, you know, because of course we're re really playing with, with the image sound relationships and, and taking, you know, this interview audio and juxtaposing it with the archival footage in some very deliberate ways that create not only uncanny resonances, you know, between the interview audio and the archival footage, but also like very meaningful dissonances. Uh, and there, I think, you know, there, there are some ways in which the original intention of the footage is perhaps turned against itself or subverted in, in some ways. It's hard to know in some cases exactly what was originally intended for a specific shot or a specific scene because some of the directors didn't remember <laughs> like exactly what they had intended for, for every aspect of these films right. that they had made more than 20 years ago, 30 years ago in some cases, you know? And with the April Revolution, of course, that director's dead. So, you know, the only person left to talk about it was the cinematographer, Latif. Um, and the person who originally scripted it, of course, is also dead, Hafizullah Amin. So, you know, what was originally intended for the April Revolution is, you know, that's, that's sort of left to us to guess at this point, right? With some of these films, when we were looking at the footage, we felt like perhaps the cinematographer had, you know, put certain things into the footage that the director had not necessarily been as attentive to, or perhaps the production designer had been throwing a few things in there that, that were really specific, or there were other people on the team who, who perhaps had also, you know, inserted their own intentions into it that were layered on top of what the director was doing. Um, that were things that we could then pull out of the footage. Mm. I'm just curious what their reception to your film has been like. Uh, well, I did show it to everyone um, who participated in the film before it was shown in Afghanistan uh, in order to, to get their permission to show it in Afghanistan. And I asked them if they wanted anything taken out before it was shown in Afghanistan, like if they wanted me to make a specific Afghan version, uh, because you know, there, there, there are things that are said in the film that might potentially be dangerous for people to say. I think they did really like it. Um, there were, there's two of the people I interviewed for the film are now dead actually. Um, 
Fakir Nabi and, and Joan Sher Haidari both died in the last two years. Um, so that that's, that's one of the really you know sad things, but also I'm very glad that we managed to to do this before before they died um, and to, to actually get them on film and have them talking about their work in this way. And also we screened it in the screening room that's in the film. So that was really kind of special uh, because the last shot of the film is of the screening room um, at Afghan Films. And then, so when the film ends, you're like in the screening room <laughs> that's on the screen. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, which is really, really nice. A uh, little meta moment. Could you tell us what you think about the role, position, and function of the archive in an environment uh, where its existence is perpetually under threat? And how do you think this precarity shapes how the archive moves and interacts? I'm not crazy about talking about the archive, like in, in this super generalized sense. Uh, that theory often talks about the archive. Having worked with a lot of archives, I often, I always want to insist on the sense that archives are, are extremely concrete material assemblages as well as very much communities of people. And that really inflects how each particular archive survives or doesn't survive. Um, not only its material reality and its particular material assemblage and that, you know, how fragile or not fragile those particular materials might be, but also, you know, how tenacious that particular community is um, in its attachment to those materials and its desire to preserve them. The case in Afghanistan has been really interesting because you'd think that a uh, an archive like the Afghan Film Archive would really be under threat. And it's so astonishing that it survived in this Taliban period when uh, film was outright banned. You know, there's two reasons why it survived. And one is that the community of people attached to the, the films was so uh, tenacious and, and really had such a strong desire to preserve the material and was very canny about doing it. And the other is that, of course, you know, when it comes to film, there's always someone who wants to preserve the film, even in a government that officially wants to ban the film. So there was someone in the Taliban government who wanted to preserve the films um, and who tipped them off when, you know, the, the Taliban were coming to burn the films. Somebody tipped them off and told them to hide the film. So you know, they had someone protecting them. And even like the television archive also, they're um, in Afghanistan are among the best protective archives in the world in a very weird way because they're inside the green zone in Kabul. So they're surrounded by just massive barricades of security, um, which is an accident of, of geography in a way. But it doesn't necessarily render them more or less safe in the long term because it all depends on who ends up in charge of the government. My position on preservation in general for archives like this is that the best way to preserve them is to disseminate them. <laughs> uh, and that's why I've been so supportive of digitization for um, the Afghan Film Archive as its best long-term preservation strategy. So I think in order to really really preserve these films, what needs to happen is that they need to be digitized and then there need to be copies all over the place. Um, and the more people know about the films and the more people have seen the films, um, then you know even if the physical copies are destroyed, the films will survive. The films will survive either in the copies or just in the kind of memories and knowledge of people going forward. Um, and I think that's so important, you know, um, it's preservation by projection. Right?